everyone. Welcome back to Milwaukee Uncut, sponsored by Central Standard Distillery and in partnership with On Milwaukee and produced by Storymark Studios. We have two Marquette legends here today from the 2003 NCAA Final Four team, Travis Diener and Steve Novak. As many of you know, both went on to have successful professional careers and after living all over the place, both came back to Milwaukee. Novak currently broadcasting for the Bucks, and Travis is a partner at the facility in Mequon and both are very involved in the Be The Difference NIL initiative. Thanks for coming down today. Great to be here. Thanks for having us. Um, so before we get into all the amazing fan submitted questions, um, let's start more from the beginning. How did each of you end up at Marquette? Well, well for me, it was, I'm a year older than Steve. Uh, he's about, th he's actually three or four years older, but one year older academically. That's yeah. fine. Go ahead. Yeah. You're good. I'm um, sure you're a very intelligent guy. Yeah. Yeah. Across, yeah. <laughs> yeah. From Brown Deer. Yeah. Yep. Um, but Fond du Lac. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, I didn't mean to know. <laughs> You know, as a as a young younger athlete, you know, once you start having success, you get recruited by schools, and uh, Marquette uh, ended up being the the school that I thought fit uh, who I was as a player the best. Coach Crane did an incredible job recruiting me, selling me on a on a vision that he had for for our team and, and for myself, and something that maybe I didn't see in myself when he was recruiting me, but everything that he kind of uh, you know laid out to me came to fruition and uh it was probably the, the best decision that I, I could have, have ever made at that point in my life and i went back and forth between schools and, and which one i would you know see myself most at and you know fortunately I, I think i made the right one and uh you know i think you know going back on it uh, the, the memories that i have of of going to school close to where i'm from and and now you know 20 years later still you know, living in this area just is a testament to, to my experience at, at Marquette. It, w it was a good story. You were going to go to SLU, right? Boy, you've done your research. Yeah. No, I was, I, I had went on an official visit uh, to St. Louis. My cousin was playing there, which uh, helped. Uh, Coach Romar, who was a former player, actually, uh, you know, I hit it off really well with him. He understood, you know, the, the dynamic of being a player. Um, I went on the official visit, had a great time. Um, and went home that night uh, and told my my mom uh, that I was going to commit on Monday because it was a Sunday night on Monday to St. Louis. My dad was asleep. I went up and told my dad he was half asleep. I was like, uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, I came back down, and you know my my two sisters, two younger sisters, and my mom were like in tears, and I'm like. It's what just happened in the last five minutes to somebody like somebody sick, somebody dying or what. And they just, they didn't want me to go uh, that far away for school. And it's, I mean, it's only six hours from final. I'm like, okay. Uh, so that kind of, that kind of ruled out St. Louis. So it, it, at, at the end, it ended up being between Marquette and Wisconsin. And uh, that's a no brainer, right? Good choice. Great choice. That was close. Yeah. And you got to play with this guy right here. Well, yeah, he came along the next year and, uh, you know, that team that we had when we went to the Final Four was just a collection of, uh, I think, high character, high chemistry, high together guys, and that, you know, obviously really talented team. But you know, you need a lot more than just talent to to reach those uh, heights. And uh, adding Steve from one from my freshman year to my sophomore year was just a, such a huge addition, along with you know the other freshmen, but uh, Steve in particular. Steve, how did you end up at Marquette? You know, and it really was kind of a, a similar process with, you know, different places and names involved. But to be honest, Travis was uh, a big part of why I went to Marquette. Obviously, Coach Crean was there. And I think, you know, as a recruiter and as somebody who, you know, you're looking for that figure, that coach to be able to truly make you better, to truly develop you, not only to give you an opportunity to win a championship, but to play at the next level beyond. I think, you know, you're, you're 16, 17, 18, maybe 20 if you're Travis. Uh, years old at that point as a senior, nice. junior, senior in high school. 18, and, man. It's okay. I took I took a victory lap myself, so I respect <laughs> that. You. Carry we, on. We, we can't let him live that down. That's fine. <laughs> but, um, you know, he obviously, I think, was always that front runner figure for me that I always thought, you know, could develop me and could make me better. And you don't, at that age, like I was joking about, you, really, you don't know really what you're looking for. It's like choosing a spouse and trying to do the best, make the best decision. But, I mean, there's 90% of the stuff that you just don't know. But, you know, Travis being at Marquette, it's like I saw him 
I thought, you know, take that leap of faith and commit to Marquette. And Scott Merritt had done that. And so those guys were kind of in the area, guys that I had watched and known. And so I think it made my decision. I think it just paved the way, I think, for me to say, like, look, this is where the guys from the area are going, the guys that I would like to play with are going. And, you know, I almost committed similar to, to Travis to, to Illinois. I told my parents I was, I was going to commit to Illinois. Bill Self was there. They had a, a heck of a team. Darren Williams, uh, a bunch of guys, Final Four team. And uh, it was kind of the same conversation. My mom was like, the next day, you know, kind of let me make the decision. And the next day kind of let me know that it wasn't really my decision. And she's like, well, you know, we think Tom is, Coach Crane is probably the best, you know, for you, you and put the right guys around you and he can develop you. And, oh, and by the way, you're 20 minutes down the street from Brown Deer, so that's also helpful. So I think similar to Travis's experience, I think we were just both so blessed to be a part of the process, to be offered all over the country at different schools. But then I think realized we had Tom Crane, Marquette University, and, you know, just a really special place in our backyard. So it's where, where we ended up. And, you know, like Travis said, in my first year and his second in the Final Four. So uh, felt very validated, I'd say, very quickly. So playing for Tom Crane, Travis, you said on other interviews you hated him a lot during the season, yet he was able to bring the best out of you guys. You wanted to quit at times. What, what, was, what was that like? playing with him practices every day it was uh it was hell uh it was challenging uh mentally uh physically um emotionally uh but you know i think it built incredible toughness collectively uh individually collectively uh if you could if you could get through it um and you had a vision that at the end of this is, is it's all going to work out uh, and you know he never he never wavered on his on how he coached us. It didn't matter if you were the best player, the sixth man, the tenth man. He was hard on everybody, but I think he was fair. And uh, you know, you had to bring it. And the greatest thing that he ever did was he had an incredible energy about him that he brought every single day. And that's a skill. And I've always, I was always, I always marveled at at his energy level. And it could be sometimes it could be really tough on us. Other times he would surprise us and, and it'd be uh, really relaxed practice or maybe not as long. But um, I've always respected that about him is he always came with the same energy. And, you know, practices should be hard. It should be hard to achieve great things. And uh, I, I appreciate him a lot more right now than I did, you know, when I was in school, for sure. Is there, is there any story, specific story that stuck out to either you with him? Well, the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a well, lot. Narrowing it down I mean, to one is definitely yeah. difficult, but there's definitely one that I think Travis and I kind of share often, usually when we're back together with like a Final Four reunion or just at anybody that was on the team at the time. But we had just played UAB <laughs> and we're on the bus and we're headed back to the airport to fly back home to Milwaukee. And Travis and I had kind of gotten into it in the timeout. And I don't even remember the, the specifics as to what you said or why I was mad at you. But, you know, Travis plays with fire and he always was a passionate is a passionate player. And so he said something in the huddle and he just wants to win. He's just trying to get me going. And uh, I don't remember how I responded, but I said something back to him. And I think at the end of the day, Coach Crean always wanted me to be more of a fighter and to stand up for myself more and to be more of a leader. And, you know, Travis, I think very much more naturally kind of had that fire led by example. But in that moment, it felt to me like, all right, well, you know what? Like he's saying something to me that I don't like. And I'm going to go back at him. And we're in this game where UAB's got the you know fastest 40 minutes in basketball. They're pressing us all over. We end up losing that game. We're on the bus. We're on the way back. He stops the bus as soon as we get to the, the hangar. We're about to get off and get on the plane. He basically calls up, Travis, come on up here. Steve, come up here too. And we come up and we're like, I don't know, like maybe we got to get the bags off first or I don't know what we got to do. And we step off the bus and he basically gets us outside and is like references the timeout, the, the conflict that we had that was – same minor at the time and said like you guys don't seem like you like each other we were like <laughs> yeah like sometimes we don't and he's like you guys were talking to each other kind of crazy in that time out and it seems like it's been building and you guys have been acting like this we're not going to bring this home like you guys want to handle this right here <laughs> and i was like look i'm from brown deer i'm definitely tougher than a fondy guy but i was like i'm not much of a fighter i would have whooped his ass <laughs> see that's there you go yeah, that's fine but coming out. It was almost it's got, like it got a little longer reach than you. Yeah, yeah I was gonna. I, was, you're starting to think. Been, I know I would have been. I would have taken it to like the bars of fun. I would have had to tackle him, get inside of him. He, Crane would have loved it too. But it's like he'd have jumped down. We're like, what yeah, are you doing, guys? This point, is for us. At that point, it was like, 
All right, coach. I almost like I think I almost like chuckled. Like we're not gonna. We're, we're, we're kind of like fight. looking at each <laughs> other. Like, are you about to swing? Yeah. Should I swing? Are we doing? Like, <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, but yeah, that was that was kind of wild. He wanted. He actually. He wanted he really, to see. He it. wanted to see his fight, and I think ultimately, like I don't. I think I said something crazy in the timeout, which kind of ignited the whole thing. And I think I ended up. I I could be wrong, but I probably apologized for what I had said and and uh we just got back on the bus but you know there was there was a number of instances where you know Kareen would would try to uh motivate or you know try to get the best out of all of us and at that point I think Steve's right he, he was trying to get Steve to you know Steve was at that point was developed still developing into being one of our our best players and he wanted him to be I think more vocal and take more ownership of the team and me naturally being a point guard I think it came a lot easier for me uh Steve was great at you know, leading by example, like guy was always in the gym, uh, would, you know, would I almost have to kick him out of the gym, but I think coach wanted to see him more vocal, show maybe a little more, uh, not passion, but maybe fire towards his teammates or, or whatnot. It seemed like an interesting team dynamic in a way, because Travis, you were very fiery, obviously. And it seemed like, obviously, you played with D Wade, who seemed more kind of laid back, obviously very competitive, but s similar in that way where he was more lead by example, would you say? Yeah, I mean, I, I, Dwayne was, uh, you know, the, the Dwayne I think you see now publicly was a lot different back in college. And I, I mean, that, obviously that happens with a lot of, you know, you develop, you mature, you get comfortable. I think it was, uh, Dwayne was always quiet. Practice, ultra competitive, but quiet. And uh, I think that was always a, a challenge for Coach, too, is to get him to, to be more vocal. I know the year he sat out uh, w when he first got to Marquette, you know, Kareen during games had him sit right next to the coaching staff. He was, like, taking stats only to get him ready to be a, to be a leader because everyone knew I mean, probably the first day on campus, like, just so special this player. I mean, I did. The first time I ever saw him play, I was like, holy, holy shit, who is this guy? Like, and they were selling me when they were recruiting me, like, we got this guy sitting out. He's gonna. He can change the program. I'm like, yeah, he's sitting on. Of course, say about everybody, but then you see him once or twice, and you're like, yeah, this this guy has it. But the coach was always, uh, maybe not to the same degree as Steve, but always trying to get him to to vocalize a little more, to lead more by, I think, talking. And but Dwayne was was, uh, I would say, a pretty pretty quiet uh, individual. I mean, he was he around us. He was more outspoken, but you know, even around campus or, uh, you know, he's just quiet. Yeah, and I don't think that's an. I just think with young guys, we both coach, you know, youngsters now. He's you coach boys and girls from, you know, all, all the high school ages and youth ages. And I mean, and I do as well. But I think about even like I played with Giannis for a couple of years. And I think I watched, like, like Travis is saying with D Wade at that time, it's like D hadn't really found his voice. He hadn't really arrived. He hadn't had the triple double against Kentucky. He hadn't been drafted, you know, in the top five and gone on to have be in the playoffs the first year with the Miami Heat. And so it's like, it happens so fast that you do, you almost see this guy in front of you now who is such a leader, who's so well-spoken, who's also selling like Gucci sunglasses or whatever it is and everything else internationally. But he was so different at that time. And so I think, you know, to Travis's point, just to, you know, to compare to Wayne, it's like he, he hadn't been that vocal, that communicator, that leader that he so quickly was able to become because it happened fast. And I think you find your voice when you, you know, you have the success. I think about Giannis, he goes from, you know, not being that good to being most improved. And all of a sudden, it's like, all right, there's some legitimacy there. So then a couple of years later, being an MVP, and all of a sudden, it's like your voice does resonate. You do have the right to speak. You've earned the right to kind of speak up. And so it's almost, it's crazy to think about like the D-Wades and the Giannis's in those years early on before they hadn't proven, I think, to themselves and had the success that they had. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're watching these guys and, you know, they're winning NBA championships and they've done so much. And you're like, yeah, they lead by example still but they're incredibly vocal they're incredibly well spoken but it's uh it is a cool process i think especially like just to you know for travis and i we had great careers but to have played with a guy like Dwayne who became that and to see that process i think it's just such an education for us too to see just the evolution of what that looks like because there's kids we coach now that are very talented young kids there have no leadership skills but you realize look if they can continue to get better if they can have success if they work at it believe in themselves in a few years, it's pretty cool to think like, you know, I don't know if there'll be another Giannis or D Wade that we're working with over at the facility, but I think it just makes where we've come from, some of the coaches we've played for, the guys that we've played with, 
you know, it's it's pretty cool to I think have that perspective. We're blessed to have been recruited to, you know, play with guys like that. So uh, cool to be sitting here doing this too. Steve, Steve, playing with Giannis, you weren't there his rookie year, right? You were there. Yep, I was there a couple of years in. That's right. I was with him uh, 15, 16, and 16, 17. Before he was MVP. Be, uh, before I was MVP, yep. Did you yep. see that coming when you were practicing with him or playing with him on a daily basis? Was there a certain moment where you were like, holy shit, this is yeah, this is, guy yeah. could be an all-time great? I mean, it, to be honest, it's kind of crazy because I, th- I have to think about, like, as I sit here now, I always think about, like, with Giannis, did you know? And you go, like... Yeah, I knew. And then I try to think back to when I was his teammate, and you knew he was special, and you knew he was good. But you don't just all the time experience the greatest ever at a current moment. And I think about that with Travis and playing with D-Wade. And the first time I remember playing with D-Wade at the old gym at Marquette, and people are like, did you know how good he was? And like, yes, Travis saw him and said, like, this dude's special. I remember playing with him the first time, and I was like, his wingspan, his athleticism, his instincts, he's special. But like, I'm from Brown Deer, Travis from Fine Lake. We haven't played with a guy who's about to go on and win NBA championships and be an international star and a finals MVP. And so I think you know they're special, but you don't really know that you're playing with a guy who is going to be the greatest player in Marquette's program and go on to have the career they had. And for Giannis, it's like I played with him. He was dominant. You knew you couldn't stop him, but you just hadn't really experienced playing against the greatest player in this era. I think Giannis, you know, and pick which year you want to pick, is was that. For some of those stretches and so looking back I feel like I kind of knew but at the time when I think back to my thoughts I think you just know you're playing with someone special and they go on to have to achieve those accolades and you go like wow well that's why I thought they were good because they're <laughs> the best in the NBA right now you know what was Giannis's work ethic like was that when they were still at the Cousins Center practicing or was that yeah I heard he was like just living there I, I think that's what makes him special is you, you know you often hear life advice like you need balance in your life and you know you need to have other things than just basketball I think that that's probably generally true and good advice for most people but I also think to have outliers and to have people like Kobe's and D Wade's and Giannis's you've got to be wired different and I think that's what makes Giannis who he is it's like he he has kids now and and family and so I think he does have more balance but aside from that I think like he's not really interested in balance he wants to be the greatest player of all time and I think he wants to just spend his time playing basketball and finding ways to get better. If that means, you know, having the greatest therapists and strength workouts and building his own gym like he did so he can be in there more. I think that's what he's about. And I think guys like him, they push the limits of there's a lot of people that give you advice and say, I'm the psychology doctor, I'm the sports psychologist, I'm the medical staff, I'm the strength guy, I'm the basketball guy. And they're going to try to teach Giannis. But I think Giannis is so special in that him, a Kobe, a a Jordan-esque type of guy, they have to always be willing to think about the possibility that in order to be the greatest, they actually have to do things differently than anyone who's giving them advice can give them. And so I think to me, that's, that's what's cool as he lives in the gym and continues to think that actually to be the greatest, he might have to do something different than Kobe's ever done, right. more it, than him. And it seems like both of you did that a lot as well. Coming out of high school to Marquette and even when you got to Marquette, did either of you think you were going to play in the NBA? No, no, I never, I never dreamt of, of, I never even, my, my only goal, to be honest, when I was like a little kid was to play for my uncle in high school. I thought that was the NBA. Um, and then I get to Marquette and, you know, you have some success early and then you still don't, even when we went to the final four, I remember uh, in the press conference, I don't know if it was after the game or whenever we did media after the season was over, everyone, we all knew that Dwayne was leaving. But I got a question like, are you thinking about leaving? And it was the first time that ever even crossed my mind. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm not even close to that level yet. So I never even thought about it until maybe that summer when Coach was like, you know, you have a legitimate chance to play in the NBA if you continue to if you continue on the path you're on and you keep getting better and better in these things. And and that was kind of the first time when I was probably tw- you know, twenty, twenty one years old where, you know, it was uh it it was something to kind of strive for, you know. Did you think you would do anything else with your life? Because it seems like with you, you're just addicted to basketball. Yeah, yeah. I, I just thought I'd be involved in basketball in some okay. way my whole life. So I, I did, obviously, I didn't. I just said I didn't, I didn't expect to play in the NBA, but I thought then I'd just get into coaching or something like that. But basketball is, uh, you know, I tell my wife all the time, like, you know, I, I was just people are put 
in this world for certain things. I was here to to be involved in basketball, to play basketball. I love it. I love the sport. I love everything about it. I love coaching my my girls now. I love, you know, I could sit and watch my third grader play basketball, and that and people would be like, "Man, that's crazy. Like that's kind of boring, isn't it?" It's like, I don't know. There's just something about it. There's the game is so pure at that age. Um, but I just love the sport. It doesn't matter if it's men's, women's. Pro, college, high school, um, and it's something I, I truly value, and it's it's kind of made, kind of defines me a little bit is is the sport, for sure. Steve, what about you? you- uh, yeah, I always I always dreamed of playing in the NBA. Like even when I was a youngster, I just remember just watching like the, the Sunday doubleheaders and thinking, man, oh man, do I want to I want to play in the NBA? I was watching Shaq and Kobe, you know, like every weekend, thinking. You know, this is what I want to do. But to Travis is really along the same lines. I think there's something very like grassroots and organic about my dad was a high school coach. And so I dreamed of being his high school players. And so it wasn't like I was trying to go from an eight-year-old to Kobe. I was trying to aspire to be that high school player. And so I think when it happens, it's almost like, all right, you're making those steps. And so I think, you know, the, the fact that we both did make it to the league and played at the highest level I think does have a lot to do with the fact that the people we looked up to were people we could touch. We could be there close to these high school athletes and his uncle, his dad, his you know, family was in the gym. I grew up the same way at Brown Deer. My pops was a coach. And so I think just the environment to me, like as a youth coach, I think the most important thing when people are like, you know, we want our kids to make it, whatever that even means. I just think it, when I think back to what set me apart, obviously fine and blessed to be six, nine I mean, Travis isn't six, nine, but he, was able to find his way too. And I think a lot of it had to do with the environment that you're in and the experience. And there comes a point when you got to be pushed and you got to be coached. I mean, no one's making it without, you know, working their tail off. But I think what makes Travis and I unique is the environment, the environment that we grew up in basketball wise. We were always in the gym. We were around our family and had great role models in our, in our communities. What was the final four run like for you guys? I tell people all the time, it's hard to, when you're in that moment, it's hard to, it's hard to reflect. It's hard to think back to it because you're, you're so concerned about the next game. So you beat, we had a very tough game in the first one, Holy Cross. And then you're thinking, well, 48 hours, we're playing Missouri. You beat Missouri. And then, you know, early the next week, you're playing two more games. So it's hard to, it's hard to really enjoy it. Um, You know, I think it was uh, obviously the people that followed Marquette and they tell, I think it's, it's easier now when people come and talk to us about it and we can kind of reflect on it. When you're in the moment, it's hard to appreciate kind of what you're going through. So for me, it was, and I'm sure Steve's the same way in our whole team. It was like, coach was never going to allow us to be satisfied. So it was like, okay, what's the next thing on the schedule? Okay. Well, we got, we have to play Pittsburgh. Well, we beat Pittsburgh. Now we got Kentucky. Okay. Be Kentucky. Now it's Kansas. So it's, it was never a time where it was like, you know, you're just going out and partying because you made it to the Final Four. There's no time for it. You know, I think maybe after the season a little bit, you got to enjoy uh, the fruits of going to the to the Final Four. But, you know, that team totally changed. Dwayne left. Uh, Robert Jackson graduated. So then it was like, okay, now I still had two more years left. He had three more years left. He was still, you know, essentially a baby. I mean, he was a freshman. So the jump from freshman to sophomore year is huge for him. So I don't think I ever got to really enjoy it. Uh uh, like you'd probably imagine. Um, and I, yeah. I don't speak for C, but I, I think it was everybody on that team. Yeah, I think, you know, in, in sports, I think about, as Trav's talking, I'm thinking about like 10 different examples of exactly what he's explaining where people say to you, like, what was that like to play, like you had said earlier about with Giannis when he was, you know, on the cusp of greatness. And you're like, looking back, now I see like, wow, that was awesome. And I think about even Lynn Sanity when I play with Jeremy Lynn and he goes on this run. And people are like, what was it like to be in Lynn Sandy? And you, we thought it was over pretty much every game, but it kept happening. And the same with the Final Four. It's like, Holy Cross, we're thinking, thank God we survived. And then you're, you, you don't enjoy any of it because you're, it's always about that next moment, that next step, the surviving of it. And so, um, you know, people say to me, I'm sure Trav gets this all the time, like, when did you realize, you know, you had made it? Or when did you realize you were going to make it, you know, to the NBA? And I think, I think back, and I, to Travis, the same point, like I remember Bo Ellis coming up to me after a, the UConn game when I had my best college game. And after the game, he said to me, young man, you just made yourself a lot of money. And I think back and I remember, I, I didn't even understand what he was saying to me then. But now looking back, I go, someone who has been through it, who is older is looking back going like, I see where you're headed. 
But even then, I'm thinking, I'm not sure I'm good enough. I'm not sure I've made it. And so we'll go, what was it like getting to that point? Whatever, athletically, insanity, uh, win streak or whatever. And I think in order to achieve those things, you often have really no idea it's going on until it's, it's just about over. And so uh, the final four for me, like Trav's saying, I was a freshman. My head was spinning. I mean, this was my first college experience where it's like, oh, this is college? Like you go on an NCAA run and you end up in the final four. And it was like by the, when the season ended, even then, I was like, had no, I, I almost had the experience not going to the final four to realize what going to the final four was. Yeah, the, when you win against Kentucky to actually make it, which I think that's the first time Marquette got there in 20-something years. 20, yeah, 27, yeah. Yeah. Was was that locker room very celebratory after that? Was Kareem going crazy, or was he just like, we got more work to do? Or was there a celebration then the next morning it was like back to work? There, I mean, so that's there was, a big deal. Yeah, there was definitely a celebration. Yeah. Like, we were – we were ecstatic. We were excited. Uh, the thing is, is we 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 bust down to or we bust up to Minneapolis. So we had that long bus ride back, which was great because that was, I mean, essentially us just, you know, replaying, rehashing everything that had happened over the kind of last two weeks. And then I, I would imagine, you know, that that next morning it's like, okay, we got Kansas. But I know we celebrated that. And I think maybe maybe subconsciously, collectively. Like maybe there was a, a letdown a little bit, but I I thought going into the final four game and we got our ass kicked, but I thought we were prepared. Um, it just you know it's sports like sometimes it just doesn't, you know you can go from one week playing the best game collectively that we could have to the next week playing the worst and in the biggest moment. So uh, it can come it can come down crashing pretty hard, uh, and it did for us in the final four, but. I know. I remember. I think I, I. I remember vividly, like that bus ride from Minneapolis back to Milwaukee. Us being uh, incredibly excited about what we had accomplished up to that point. Yeah, and in, I think in college you do have a little more time to enjoy it because I just think about you know NBA career is basically like as soon as you're out of that locker room, you got to flush it because you're playing the next day or the, you know two days later. But in college there was always this I feel like ability to celebrate, but. We had also been trained, I think, very well by Coach Crane. It would be like when we would have a, a win against a team that we were supposed to beat and we beat them soundly and we played well, we would show up the next day to practice and it would be just, it would be hell. And you'd be like, what, what, could we have, what more could we have done? We won by 25 against South Florida. We held them to this and to this. And he's killing us. And it's turning into one of those practices where you're running. And so I think you certainly can sense the coach's body language like, all right, you know, he's celebrating. We're able to mess Tom's hair up a little bit after the game. And he enjoys it, but then the next day it's like you got to be careful because you got to get back to work. So, yeah, I mean, those those that run, there's no question. I think we we felt like we had all of those wins, been able to celebrate, but also regather. And so I don't I don't think any of us felt like it was unhealthy to enjoy it. But like Trev said, maybe we subconsciously enjoyed it a little too much because <laughs> Final Four didn't quite go the way we wanted. But at least you made it there. Yeah. Um, Speaking of the NBA, you were both drafted in the second round. What was that transition like? You get a check for the first time, which is probably a pretty sizable amount to two kids from Fond du Lac and Brown Deer. What was, what was, that, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, getting drafted will be one of, the, uh, one of the greatest moments athletically of my life. I mean, and I was there for – I was in the room when Steve got drafted, celebrating with him, um, you know, because I never, I never thought about it. And, and even leading up to that, um, you know, my agent's like, you know, I see you going anywhere from from late first round to like forty five, and I'm like thinking to myself, okay, like if my agent's he's saying like it's like ninety five percent chance you get drafted, and I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'm gonna have a party at my parents' bar. Uh, I don't want to be that guy that has the party and and doesn't get drafted. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm a nervous wreck the whole day, and uh, you know, Kareen got the coach, Kareen got the call, like. 15 seconds before it ended up being, I think Adam Silver was the deputy commissioner, so he announced the picks in the second round, and he gets up there and Crean's like gave me kind of a head nod, and it was uh, it was a very uh, satisfying moment just knowing that all the hard work from you know when I was a little kid to to 20 at that point I was 23 um, had paid off, and I think maybe subconsciously again there it was like you know I just took a breath and was was very. Uh, very proud of of where I had put myself, and, and obviously I've been surrounded in the environment by my family and teammates, and uh, it was just a, a moment I'll never forget for sure. 
Yeah, it's a special moment. Like Travis said, I, I think you know you dream of being drafted and for it to actually happen, and it is for sure one of the the coolest things I think that'll ever happen. It's like there, it's up there with game winners and births of children. All right, maybe I'm leaping now as far as how important it was, but I think like Travis said, to just, to just think back about like what it like the experience of what it was. You know, you're sitting there with your family and. Crean is on the phone and he's, you know, working the calls and trying to just get information from teams and from agents and front office folks. And I just remember Coach Crean was on the phone the whole time. And then he finally put his phone down for the first time. And I saw him and I was like, it was the next pick was the Houston Rockets and he put his phone down. And I'm like, how can he not be on the phone? He's been on the phone for like two straight hours. And then of course it was the next pick was, was me. And so I just remember some of those moments where it's cool. Just I think that those are those moments that make you think back to kind of just like some of the the hell days, some of the training at Marquette, and you know just it being worth it, and the fact how blessed you were to just get to that point. There's a lot of guys that worked just as hard, and you know didn't weren't able to be healthy or some other situation happened, and so I think you're just thankful for the opportunity to to actually get drafted. Was Crean like serving as your agent? What was he doing on the phone for two hours? I think when you're inve- he, when you're invested, honestly, is he talking to other yeah. GMs or what's the I think he's, he was constantly trying to get information and feedback, and it, okay. I, I don't think it was just that night. I mean, I think it was yeah. plenty leading up to that. But, you know, I think just him trying to continue to do his part when you're as invested, like Travis said, the amount of energy and time, the loss of sleep that he had for each guy individually, I think it, it was more than like, I hope I get a Marquette guy drafted. It's like you recruited Travis in his family room and went to his house in Fond du Lac and was with him for summers and summers before he ever came to Marquette. And so then it's like you get a guy to that point, and I think he's – I mean, for me, and I think I probably speak for Travis as well, as close to anybody outside the family that's, you know, a father figure as far as like how much they were invested and loved you and and showed it through sometimes, you know, pushing you and making you do things that you weren't really wanting to do, but he understood in order to help you be successful. And maybe I got to work the phones all the way to the to the last second to do to do my part. Yeah, that's cool. Um Steve, so you had uh, quite an eclectic experience in the NBA. You were on nine rosters over 14 years, according to Wikipedia. Um, you were also nicknamed Novocaine by Walt Frazier, competed in a three-point contest. Did you know uh, lowest turnover percentage in NBA in 2012, 2013? 2.63%? <laughs> yeah, I never drew uh, I was going to say, was, I'm sure Travis I mean, is a still, take on still that. still a record. You were doing yeah. the Aaron Rodgers belt all over national TV. He is the tallest guy ever to play in the, right? Ever to play in the NBA without a dunk. I mean, what other stats do you guys want to bring yeah. up here? We got the too, tallest, with the, tallest without a dunk. Yeah, lowest turnover percentage in NBA history. What, what, I mean, what else? What else you guys got? What, is, what you, else? You, is even, I, even I could dunk. Wikipedia. Jeez. Um, I'll show you a video. I'm happy to show it. I got it on camera. Um, got to be part of Insanity. Um, that was all I got. I had like six <laughs> bullet points. Um, <laughs> what was that? I think it seemed like New York might have been the highlight. Was there a certain moment or story that stood out to you from that point in time? Yeah, for me, it for sure was my NBA fit highlight. You know, the best that I played. And so much of it had to do with, you know, finding the right system, finding the right team. And then you know, a little bit of lightning in a bottle because it was Mike D'Antoni was the coach. For me, it's like to, to play a little bit of run and gun system, a perimeter-based system, a, a forgiving system defensively where I have Tyson Chandler behind me where we're funneling everything to him. It's like it, it fit me very much. And I think the story I would just say that epitomizes what it was, was like Mike D'Antoni would basically like in timeouts, he would just say to me, Steve, listen, if you score more points than the guy that you're guarding, you're going to stay in the game. Because I think a lot of people get caught up with, oh, we got blown by, or oh, we got scored on. And it's like just the most delusional thought. I mean, I watched Travis in the TBT. He's getting scored on every time, but as long as he's making million-dollar shots, all is good. And Mike D'Antoni kind of had that philosophy the whole time. He's like, listen, your guy can score. It's fine. If he scores two and you score three, we're up one, right? He's like, he kept it so simple. And so he would honestly, like in some timeouts, look down at the other bench and try to see who they were putting in the game. And they would take a long time to get up and he would finally say, forget it, let's go. Just go out here, just score more points than your guy. And I think that philosophy versus like the fear of a guy getting scored on or a guy being in the wrong spot every once in a while. Because for me, look, I wasn't the greatest defensive player, but I was in the NBA for 11 years, and Mike D'Antoni was a, a coach for me that just said, look, I'm going to coach you for the things that you do well instead of act like, you know, I got to have guys out here that do everything right. And we won, you know, 50 games two years in a row. So he had it figured out. But for me, it was it was awesome, I think, just to, to find the right fit, to find the right system. And I think we always just strive to 
to show what we've worked so hard to do. And I feel like he was a guy that kind of gave me that opportunity. Um, going back to your time with the Knicks and during Linsanity, I was doing my homework and texting some people and a story stuck out to me. I heard you were invited to the NBA dunk contest. One, is, that, is that true? This is true. Yeah. To so, actually dunk. Or to, do, so yeah, I had, I've never dunked in an NBA game, which is true. Uh, it, so the year that I led the NBA in three-point percentage, we were pushing, my agent was pushing to give me the three-point contest. And they basically said, Steve, the spot is yours, but we have an open invite to Kevin Durant. And if he takes it, obviously the stars always are the guys you want in that stuff. And if you know they're busy or they want to go to the Bahamas or they choose not to, then a guy like me who happens to lead the league in three-point percentage could be in the three-point contest. Well, KD opted in late and said, I want to be in. So I basically got bumped out. But they said, but we have good news. I said to my agent, basically, we want to have Jeremy Lin involved in the dunk contest because that was the year that he basically had slept on Landry Field's couch when he first got to the team. And the story went big about Jeremy sleeping on Landry's couch in his apartment and being his buddy. And they wanted to have Landry jump over a couch with Jeremy Lin laying on it and have Landry dunk. But Landry had nerve injury in his elbow, so he had to back out. So they asked J.R. Smith if he would do it, if he'd jump over the couch and it would still kind of work. And he said, sure, I'll do it. And then he tweaked his ankle a few days before that. And they said, so Steve is our guy. Are you willing to jump over a couch with Jeremy Lin laying on it and be in the dunk contest? And you can do whatever else you want with the other two dunks. And my agent basically said, now, Steve, here's the thing. Look, you get paid like, I don't know, 75000 if you win the dunk contest. That might be a stretch, Steve. You get twenty five for, for participating. It's not, a, you know, he's like, I don't, I'm not sure that's worth it for you. He's like, I think what you need to just decide is we live in a, in a, at a time where things can go very viral. And so if this goes well, it's beautiful. You'll probably get a ton of endorsements. It'll be great for your brand. If it doesn't, he's like, I just, I'm not sure to the extent that this, how bad this would be for you. <laughs> Do you think you could have done it? I would have had to get a couple extra stretches, maybe, you know, get a few. I mean, jumping over a couch is not easy when you've never done it. No, no, no. Look, I'm a little older now, but have you, for, have you forgotten how athletic? So yeah, I, no, I, I quickly haven't. opted not to do it. <laughs> and I was in the three-point contest next year. You don't think I could jump over a couch? No, no. Blake Griffin jumped over a Kia. No, no. I'm not saying I'm Blake. He's, I'm saying it's Blake. a Kia and a couch. Did you see what he did there? He's got zero career dunks and he yeah. thinks he's jumping over a couch. In front of a packed house. Yeah. Where was yeah. All Star Weekend that year? With Jeremy Lin on it during during Prime Lin Sanity. I'm not sure actually. And the the funniest part about it is All Star Break is is really always about. I don't know because I was on a beach somewhere. Did you pra Did you practice it at all to see if you could do it before you made that decision? I didn't. I think my agent he 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 cared enough about me to to really lay it out and yeah, just he decision. made it my decision but i think at the end of the day he wasn't going to great let decision me. yeah and mark Bar bartlestein <laughs> probably thank thank you I shout mean, out to mark the, bartlestein the, it would have went viral either way <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly well that's, that's what definitely. i was worried about What's, yeah no why probably got more endorsements by failing yeah, yeah. I mean, you get a seven foot white guy potentially yeah. landing on jeremy lynn while sitting on the couch yeah. that well, would have gone viral sure. landed on for sure. <laughs> my greatest regret is not being in the dunk contest i guess we can that's I never official. heard that one. That's I never heard that one. Yeah, I'm a professional over here. Yeah, you I are. Homework. Um, it is. That's a good one. Travis, you you had an interesting pro career as well too. Six NBA seasons, three in Italy. Got your jersey retired, yeah. and then and then and then yeah. another okay. three okay. after that. I got you. And then it was only five years in NBA. Okay. Well, Come on, he said I played I 14. I only played 11. Let that was, it go. That was Wikipedia. I yeah. apologize. It's, Wikipedia got you. When it's high, you gave you, you an extra it. year as well. Extra year. What what stuck out to you, and what was the difference between Euroball and NBA? Well, the best athlete, I think the best athletes in the world play in the NBA. Uh, you know, it's a high pace, physical. Um, I think overseas, it's uh, very skill based. Everyone can shoot, pass more. You know, team oriented as far as uh, how maybe the scoring is distributed. The best teams in in Europe, you'll have like five guys averaging anywhere from. 10 to 14 points um so it's a brand of basketball that fits the way i like to play um and i was blessed to play for the same coach for all seven years uh in two different teams and he gave us he's a lot like uh coach d'antonio who ironically enough is uh, you know he's italian at a lot of you didn't have to play defense either and that no, probably I fit you well I, no I, funny story my my coach used to always come and meet with me like show me clips like okay you got to play defense i was like 
once I got to know him better and better through this, like, coach, you guys aren't paying me to play defense. Like, I'm here to pass, shoot, and that's it, and lead. And um, but overseas was great. It was uh, I love living. We love living over there. The kids loved it. It's a relaxed. Uh, it's the culture there is incredible. The fans were incredible. It reminded me a lot of of being back in school uh, at Marquette with the excitement about each game. Um, and I've uh, just very memorable uh, experience all seven years, really. Hey, everyone, it's your host, Richie Burke. And I just wanted to take a minute to thank you for tuning into Milwaukee Uncut and to thank our sponsor, Central Standard Distillery. They've got an amazing craft house right here in downtown Milwaukee, and they've got a lot of drink options from their dockside whiskey to their ready pour mixers. And my personal favorite, the Door County Cherry Vodka. And my favorite drink is something I like to call the PAL, perfect alcohol level. Great for those situations where you need a quick boost of confidence, but also want to be hydrated and light on your feet. What I do is put a couple shots of the Door County Cherry Vodka into a water bottle, as well as an LMNT electrolyte packet. Keeps me fresh, keeps me hydrated, and keeps me feeling good. Perfect on the golf course and for a number of other life situations. Thank you to Central Standard. Let's get back to the show. I want to talk about the TBT shot now. You you came back out of retirement. Um, weren't going to play in the TBT that year, but you got a, a phone call on the golf, or you got signed up against your will and then ended up making a million-dollar shot. Can you touch on that experience? Yeah, it was uh, – the TBT is fun because, it you know, you get a chance to – to put on a jersey again and compete with guys that for me it was guys that were a lot younger than me but it was guys that represented marquette um keeps you young uh, and and you know that the shot was just it was it was i think the one moment in my life where i felt uh incredibly calm about the situation I, even the night before the game i was telling the guys there's no doubt in my mind we're winning this game it was it was really kind of weird because i'd never felt that in any game i've ever played like I, that i i always thought we were gonna win but i never like what it say, like we are for sure winning this game, and uh, you know it, it ended up being a, a kind of a broken play, and you know I was wide open, and fortunately, you know made the shot, and it's just a moment that will, you know, your your career as a basketball player, as an athlete, or I think anybody is is filled with all these moments, and it was just another moment for me that uh, was was incredible because you know my my kids got to see that my kids are are still young enough where they didn't get to see me play in the NBA. Uh, they got to see me a little bit overseas, but they weren't old enough to really understand. My oldest kids got to see that. And, uh, you know, to share that with, you know, my family, I think was uh, something that I'll never forget. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's it's a lot of money, but more importantly, I think it was just another moment for me to, to kind of, just another basketball moment. Yeah. And you got to see that clip of your dad at the bar. Yeah, I mean that's what it's too. kind of. That's that I mean was, my that was cool. Yeah, my dad is. Uh, if you if you couldn't tell where I get the the fire and the passion from, and uh, he had a couple of viral moments throughout the TBT. He goes crazy. It's uh, it's it was uh, it's funny to watch. And that was that was actually during like, you know, we won it was during COVID. So I think he was getting some some crap for not having a mask on or something like that. But he was, you know, I don't <laughs> think he cared really. Not in Fond du Lac. No, nah, they not in Fond yeah. du Lac. Um, and you got you guys lost in the finals the year before that, right? Those and you get nothing for losing in the finals, Zero. all or nothing. I know Jake Thomas was really happy. Yeah, about Jake that. was he not got... happy because then the next year we didn't bring him back and we won. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Jake so, Thomas, friend of the show. So yeah, yeah, no, Jake's we we like yeah, Jake. We'll buy some beers for Jake. He's yeah. a good guy, and yeah, yeah, he missed out on a million bucks, but we got beers for him. 80 ish yeah. grand, right? Yeah. Ninety when you divvy 90, it up. Ninety three, yeah. Yeah, it's a Sorry, de Jake. decent amount of beers for, <laughs> for Jake Thomas coming your way. Um, Sorry, Jake. Speaking of money, let's switch to the, the NIL. Both of you are very involved in the Be the Difference NIL. Is it a collective? Is that the yeah. correct word for it? Collective. Um, what is the Be the Difference NIL? Uh, essentially, it's, it's a, you know, it's donors of, of Marquette basketball that are, are, are putting their money into this collective that in return will send our men's and women's basketball players out in the community with nonprofit organizations, uh, big brothers, big sisters, uh, Mac fun, boys and girls club, a variety of different organizations 
they do you know they do these events they use their platform uh, it's a win-win situation for everybody involved it's the, the players obviously now the student athletes obviously now have a have their name image and likeness they can get compensated for work uh, these organizations love it because you know high profile you know athletes are coming and spending time with their kids or their organizations um, and it doesn't obviously it doesn't cost them anything the collect the collective is funding these events collective is funding the players so uh, it's a win-win we're trying to do it the best way possible obviously NIL is relatively new and it's with with other programs and other schools we've seen it run a little differently which is not uh, the way that Marquette is going to do it and I think that's what you know kind of intrigued Steve and I to get involved is well if we're going to do it we got to do it the right way and I think it's this is the best way possible where at least there's some goodwill going into the community into the Marquette community the Milwaukee community and there's uh, especially with how well both programs are playing the the visibility with the players is 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 as high as it's been in a long long time yeah, and I think, you know, like Travis said, I think to us the biggest difference is, look, with the rule changes and the landscape being that now college athletes can be paid for their marketability, which is really what NIL, name image likeness is, um, it's it's changing fast. And I think that there's a lot of, you know, new, there's a lot of new money and faces being introduced to it, you know, constantly, it's ever changing. And I think the reason Travis and I are involved is because we do want to do it differently here at Marquette. I think rec- we, we both recognized that it's happening and it's happening with the schools that Marquette's competing against. And it's going to happen at Marquette University, whether we're involved or not. And so I think, you know, looking back at when Travis and I played, obviously we would have loved if there was NIL opportunities. There weren't. But for Travis and I, I think to just have been through that experience, to have been a college athlete, to have been, in this case, a basketball player, to be able to, I think, be a a resource to these guys and do it the right way to not be a part of the university or affiliated with the university, but aligned, I think with a lot of Shaka's values and the university's values and do it the right way and not be a car dealership or a restaurant. And a lot of those guys are absolutely fine and they're going about the right way. But I think it's important. I think we think back to if we were in that situation, who would we hope was out there to work with us? And I think we don't have anything to gain by it. We're really attempting to to do this with Marquette University in a way that, you know, like Travis said, we can be a, a resource. We're not asking for them to sign long-term contracts with us where we have their name image likeness rights for years and years as they go on to the NBA. And so we want to be, I think, educational as much as we are a resource, you know, to to the university or to the, we're obviously separate from the university, but um, it's changing fast. And I think Travis and I are certainly, you know, invested in doing it the right way at Marquette and saying that a lot of the schools that Marquette's competing with are also doing that, then we think it's important to uh, maintain a competitive advantage and make sure we keep doing it the right way. Very well said. Um, let's move on to the standard five, five quick questions sponsored by Central Standard. I, I threw some bonus questions in there today, so we're going to have a couple more than five. But um, <laughs> starting off, if you guys could spend a day with one person, dead or alive, who would it be? <laughs> This is, this is like the, you just got to Marquette. They're doing the program. They need to do your bio there. Yeah. Uh, they get easier after this one. Don't worry. All right. Trav's got to go first. Actually, the second question is a very difficult one. Then they get easier. <laughs> yeah, you can go first. <laughs> I'm trying to think the right answer here. If there isn't, if there there's, is there's one, no right answer. Yeah, there isn't. I don't know. I tell you, if I was going to name the person I'd want to hang out with for, for just one day, I think at this point it'd have to be Elon Musk. And although... There's a lot of ways to go with it. I just feel like if, you're, if, if we're, there's going to be an end to go live on Mars, I feel like he's our guy, and he, that's, he's the guy I want to. You're taking it. I'm taking it. I'm going to Mars. Where are you going? I would, I would pick a day with Steve. You know, that's a that's an even better answer. Yeah, we can go to touching Mar- answer. Yeah, we can Sounds try, like we're going to Mars. We can try to go to Mars and fail. You guys want us all to leave the room right now? Yeah. <laughs> don't mind for a second if you leave the. If you leave the room, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, question number two, who is trivia question? Who is Marquette University's all time leading three point percentage leader? I feel like it's a trick question. Minimum five attempts, five attempts, five attempts. Oh, geez. Minimum, minimum five, five attempts. attempts. It's probably like, uh, it's probably like Jerome Whitehead, not Jerome Whitehead. It's, it's probably like, is it Kinsella? Mike Kinsella. <laughs> 
Mike Kinsella. Who, uh, I knew I knew that would be. I mean, minimum five attempts. We shot five in a, you don't, like a half. You don't seem very impressed. No, he's very I'm proud of that. Yeah, he's, that's not yeah. an official stat. That's we're, why we're, we're proud of Mike too. That's the truth. Are you? So I, I enjoy calling him Casa Mikos for the sheer <laughs> volume of Casamigos he took down at the Lombardi Scramble last year. So shout yes. out to Casa Mikos and his Casa record. Mikos. Of it's not all a record. Time. It's not official. It does not count. <laughs> minimum five attempts. He's like, not, he is not going to like that answer, but um. All right. Um, uh, TJ Marini was wondering for Travis, you have now come out of retirement four times. Do you have another run left in you? <laughs> a couple of times. Uh, have you no. actually ever retired? No. I'm not sure I've ever heard exactly. of Travis retiring. I don't Thank think he's retired. I don't want you to do it on the podcast, though. It's Bring not, the mood down. <laughs> I'm I don't not, want to, I don't I've want never you to do said that the word here. retire. I am not going to play. Yeah. Competitive yeah, basketball yeah, T, I would say TJ is not the most informed guy in, yeah. in general. So it was. <laughs> That one wasn't on me. Okay. Um, okay. You guys are coming out of a timeout. There's 10 seconds left on the clock. You're down two. Who's taking the shot? Um, well, I would have the ball in my hands. Fred would have the ball in his and hands. And we'd probably run. Well, Steve and I would probably run some sort of pick and roll, and I would have the ability to make the right decision, which probably would be to pass to Steve if he's open, and he would make it. So, Travis, no, he's asking the question. That was a very if, humble answer yeah, that if, I didn't expect it, from him. No, that's the right answer. I don't. I think I don't, as a point guard, that's right. You put yeah. the ball in the guy's hands. Gonna make, it's like you put the ball in Luca's hands, and he shoots it if he's there, and if he makes yeah. the right play. Yeah, I'll make the right play. But he's asking, Travis, I think what he's asking is if we put the ball in your hands, and if we run the right play, and the defense goes to the other three guys, and the two of us are open right next to each other, he's asking, are you shooting it, or are you giving it to me? That's what he's asking. Oh, I'm going to shoot it. Well, there yeah. you go. I'm going to make it. What if the ball was in your hands? Are you shooting it or are you passing it? Come on. I mean, if you're, bo you're both shooting Does he it. have to dribble? <laughs> <laughs> no, he could just stand there and maybe turn. Oh, then, and... yeah, he'll shoot it okay. too. Okay. Um, next question sponsored by Annex Wealth Management, Dave Spano. Um, Dave who's, Spano. Mm, Dave Spano. Who's, who, is <laughs> the, who is the best shit talker in Marquette basketball history? <laughs> Would it have been Dave Spano if he played basketball, the fiery oh, Dave, Italian out Dave, there? I think he still plays a little pickup. To, in order to be a great shit talker, you got to be able to back it up. So Dave is <laughs> Yeah, that disqualifies exactly. Dave, doesn't Dave's it? Dave's gone. It's a great I've shit talker. Him, but... I've seen him try to play basketball at Blue Mound. Yeah, me too. Behind and it does the... not end well. Um, yeah. even, on, even on the third one third court behind the caddy yeah, shack? that's exactly where it is. And I, there's You'd a, think if there was an environment he could thrive on the basketball court too, that would be it. Yeah, and he didn't. But I believe that the reason that that's his choice, his court of choice, is because I think that's the one area, probably at Blumont, that has no surveillance. So you go back there, you shoot your shots, you play whatever, you come out and he says, like, ah, I won oh, again, I, won. I, I made, made every shot. shot. And there's no and documentation no one knows. of it. So, I mean. That was about right. Uh, is there an answer to that question? Biggest trash talker. Market history. Um, I'll say Trav, Trav, was, Trav would be up there. And I think it was... <laughs> He's the kind of trash talker that certainly he does a lot of it to get himself going. If I feel like it puts him in the right mindset. He was really just looking for someone to headbutt. It seemed Robert like Robert Jackson times. would talk a lot of trash. He was good. Unfounded. It was often for Rob yeah. unfounded. Yeah, for me, Robert uh, was great. Is Kolak pretty good? Kolak talks talks shit. Yeah. He's good. He's a mass hole, right? He's from Boston. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's, he's got he's Rhode got Island. he's got he's Rhode got Island. the okay yeah, he's got the, that he, east coast yeah. east coast yeah, in him. he talks he talks some shit um ne next question this could be let's go let's go nba here favorite teammate you've ever played with for me it was grant hill uh I, you I was, played with grant yeah was, was that the magic yep okay i was a rookie he was a, a veteran um any well, good grant hill stories no just ultimate class professional um this was you know obviously after a lot of injuries and bad ankles and uh you know always looked out for for everybody and i just the ultimate teammate steve you got a lot to choose from i do i uh i'm very hesitant to give this answer because it's giving duke too much love but i think my my favorite teammate of all time at least when i was a rookie especially because was my veteran shane battier he was the guy that that literally gave me the investing for dummies book on the bus and it's like you have to read this investing for dummies book and also taught me how to to day drink uh, when season was over and 
what he, was a guy who he didn't even know how to day drink. I didn't know how to day drink. I'm from Brown Deer. We were busy doing stuff. Finally, they they day drink, but we. Oh, we yeah, you guys, you guys. What are you doing in Brown Deer? Lighting off fireworks? Or something? <laughs> yeah, we got fireworks. We got someone has to. Dude, none, none of that at Marquette. That's probably why should you guys be day made drink, the NBA. Should be day drinking right now. There were some. We, I, I made, we weren't. I we weren't the, offered. We weren't. Oh, don't say that on the podcast. We have a full fridge and it's sponsored by Central Standard. Got, got the 77 beers in there. We weren't even offered. Okay, keep it See, going. Speaking of great <laughs> teammates, right? we, we I mean, treat our think? guests well here. Steve, I'll you give do. you a nice parting gift. We have gift yeah. bags over there. Oh, so, I appreciate that. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you. Absolutely. I just yeah. want the beer. I don't know. <laughs> Someone want to run to the fridge? I do have a great the last three questions. Best teammates. Get story. The, let's get the 77 well, good, beer. Travis does need a beer. Nah, I'm just kidding. Break, yeah, yeah, get the 77 beer. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Just edit that out where I said I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go grab it. Yeah. Um, Okay, this is a NIL-related question. I want you to both answer this question for each other. Okay. It's 2004. Each of you personally get a hundred grand in NIL deals. Where's the money going? Where do you think Steve is spending that? Money. Oh, I like that. Where do you think I'm spending it? First of all, if it was a hundred thousand for me, it's Steve, under market. Steve's gonna point. Steve's gonna spend it on oh, like, here we go. on cats. Oh, I didn't see it going there. Cats. Why do you, Why do you say that? Because you had a cat. That's weird. I do you want to bring some glasses over too? He I would, might. I he might indulge. He'd have in bought this. a couple kittens. Uh, kittens. Yeah. He'd have bought a, bought a couple kittens. Uh, maybe a special breed where they're a little more expensive. Um. You know, maybe maybe a little house, a little kitten house like in what? his dorm room. What? I mean, uh, this is <laughs> you had a cat. Yeah, I did. It's okay, very, so very what? Strange. What? All right, here's what happened, and I, I honestly don't know how it happened, uh, but he I'll tell you how to. Okay, I started dating a girl who is now my wife, Christina, big, fantastic big. young lady at the time. At the, at the time, I was. I'm saying I was newly in love with her, right? And she somehow got a cat. And then, and then found out she couldn't have cats in her dorm. You know that this is true. So the cat ended up, Monty, rest in peace. <laughs> Monty. So I don't know why I'm. Ended up at Humphrey Hall living in my dorm room. And it was in the, cl- we had walk-in closets in college. Pretty awesome walk-in closet. So the cat lived in the closet. And then one time Coach Crean, unannounced, went into my room on a visit because me and Karen had the cleanest room. You did. did and, have that. And to show the recruit Humphrey Hall, and there was a cat walking around, and Coach called me into his office and was like, Steve, I was in your room, and you have a cat in your room. And I was like, how do you know that? And he's like, well, I went in your room, and there was a cat walking around. So we kind of just had it under the radar and didn't tell anyone. It's not a bad answer. I mean, it's but, back in college. You're trying to, you, maybe you're trying to impress this young lady who became your wife, and you buy a couple kittens. Yeah, it's reasonable. I, mean, I guess it's reasonable. She, 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 she must have really liked you. Maybe a special breed. Like maybe some African cat or something, you know? Yeah, you're right. I, you're right, because if, if it was Monty back then, and now I have $100,000 in college, which from Brown Deer, that's basically like $16 million. I'm interested million to see dollars. where you go with, with me here. Me too. I'll tell you what Travis does with 100000 All right, have you seen that? What's the, what's the song? What's the, I'm not sure which music video it is, but, there's, but it's Kanye and Jay-Z, and they cut the top off of a Maybach. You know they cut. I think they 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 cut the top off of a Maybach and they drive around. All right, Travis, we got your seventy-seven beer for you. Oh, I'm pretty thank sure you. Travis has. Oh, thank you. That's really kind. Cheers, Travis. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, Richard. Cheers, guys. Cheers. So, so, you so spend no, I'm saying, is it true that in Fond du Lac, with your homeboys from Fondy, many of which I know well, <laughs> you you had at some point cut the roof off of a car. And drove it around Fondy. Is that am I making you can this put it up? On the table, if you want. Yeah, uh, a 1985 uh, Grand Marquis. Okay, so there you go. That 1985 Grand Marquis with 100,000 now becomes probably a used V8 Maybach that he cuts the top off and they drive it around Marquette's campus, just like I had a cat that became some kind of like African special breed. That's yeah, the same as fair. so Travis. So is, ca- cars and cats. It's yep, a, I'd, it's a I'd name, take, good I'd name take for a his, podcast. I'd take, okay. Yeah, I'd take his kittens for a ride in my car. Okay, bo- bonus question on this. I'm a little worried about this one. Huh? Mike Mike Kinsilla gets a $10,000 NIL deal when he gets to school. Where does that money go? Hold uh, on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold golfing on. lessons. 
because he stinks. I was going to maybe say a certain establishment over in the Water Street area, but. Which is? I feel like he doesn't discriminate, but <laughs> is there a specific place? I, I'll tell you this. If you gave Mike money in college, I'll just tell you now, I'm not sure he would have he would have been able to stay in college because this is true. When he first committed to Marquette, they asked Steve, well, he's having surgery immediately when he gets to campus somehow. He was hurt when he got to campus. I picked him up from the surgeon, from the hospital. And I don't know if he was still on drugs or not, but he was like, Steve, like on campus, are we like pretty much gods? <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, no, like, no, seriously. Like, are we like, we pretty much are like in charge. He said. And I was like, Mike, you're, 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 you're not even healthy yet, guy. You're a freshman and you're not even, you're, who just got surgery. Yeah. So I just think about that Kinsella with tens of with thousands, maybe just 10,000. I don't think he makes it. I just don't good, think he. Good answer. Yeah. That was, that was a good answer. That was well thought out. Water, water, street, be, water street would have been happy. They would have been yeah. happy. Um, that's all I got. Prediction for the 23-24 season. I have already put a substantial wager down, no pressure on, on the boys, that we at least make it to Elite Eight. So, What were the odds you got on that? Uh, <laughs> it was a dumb bet by me. I went even. The odds I like are, the confidence. The you didn't, go, you didn't go to Vegas, did no. you? I'm going to go to Vegas, and I'm going to put a, a bet down there that we win it all. I like it. I think that before Steve ends, I think the team is good enough. I mean, I don't think that's saying a yeah. lot, but they're talented enough. Their togetherness, uh, it's a fun, it was a fun team this year. I just think, you know, in the tournament, a little inexperience in that moment. Um, I think next year they'll be better off for it, and I think uh, it's a bright, bright uh, – outlook for this year and i think any i think that should be the expectation that you know i think i know it is for those guys is look we're trying to get to the final four and anything less uh i don't think will be will be good enough for them yeah i think i think expectations are what make sports you know so intriguing and so i do i think with looking at the team coming back i do i think your expectation is to be a final four team um i think travis has hedged a bit and gone elite eight I think we're probably all being a little aggressive when you think about, you know, what this team did last year and already jumping up and being one of the top five teams in the league. But I think I just hesitate on the expectation side to, to put that much pressure on them. But I do. I think that this is a team that's absolutely good enough to be a to be a Final Four team. You guys, you guys, or Travis, you train now. Steve, you obviously played at a high level. Any advice to like athletes coming up who? want to do what you did or maybe play at the collegiate level? Um, it, it's, I think it's really simple. I think, you know, you just have to, uh, you have to, you have to develop a, a passion for getting better, a, a passion for work. Um, and, you know, basketball is, it, it can't, it can't be about you. You know, it's, it's about, the people that are around you, it's, it's making your teammates better. It's being a good, it's, it's being selfish, sacrificing. And I think if you do all those things and you're t obviously you have to have talent, uh, it all works out for you. But I think I see, uh, so many times where these kids are so talented these days, so skilled. I mean, much more skilled or talented than in the game has evolved than I was at that age, but they just get in their own way because they think so far ahead of where they want to get to, or it's maybe it's easier than what it really is. It's, it's hard. It's hard work. It's hard to get to, to play in college. It's hard to get to the NBA. Uh, but I think if you take it uh, in steps and really uh, put your nose down and just, you know, get better each day and, and learn the game, um, I think it, you can have some incredible experiences. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would piggyback that a little bit, but I just think I feel so strongly about like what Travis said. I just think that there's so many parents, so many kids that are at the youth level that are trying to be in the league or have college scholarships now. And I mean, it's a lot. And I don't even blame everybody for feeling that because I understand the desire. But I do think that um, finding a good group of people to compete and to play with, whether it's your, your grade school basketball team, the right high school, 
I think that's so important having that right group. And also I think what Travis said to me is the most important thing is having your eye on the dream is fine, but it really, to me becomes about the, like the 0.1% improvement, like every single day. Cause if you can improve every day, the difference between improving 0.1, which I know people say like 1%, I think that's beyond unreasonable. Like if you can get 0.1% better every day, to me, all that is doing is you're never getting worse. And if you never get worse, like the exponential power of getting just that a little bit better to me is actually just not getting worse. You're not taking steps backwards means to me that yes, the dream really is real for anyone, you know? And I think that, look, that's a large statement, but I think that, you know, Travis and I deal with so many kids that aspire to, to do special things and to be great at things. And I, I never want to tell a kid like, that's ah, probably not going to happen because the odds say this, because we were told that our whole life, yeah, you're probably not going to make it. You better have a plan B. Well, we were able to make it to the highest level. And so I am about like dreaming big and understanding you can achieve it, but it is not about dreaming about the NBA the whole time. It's about like the, every single day, one, per, like 0.1%. And so to me, that's where the focus needs to be. And then you see where it takes you. Cause look, all the stuff that Travis and I did, right. I think there was probably 90% of, what we became were things that were out of our control. We had unbelievable teammates. We had incredibly, I would call it lucky success. We have great teammates. We have great coaches. We didn't get hurt at the wrong times. So I think you just have to, I think, respect the how much of it you don't actually control. That's out of your hands. We're blessed to have had the success we had, and just like everybody who is. So I think just like that, to me, that point one to me is the advice I like to give kids is just keep heading in the right direction. You'll give yourself a chance. Love it. We'll end it there. Thank you guys so much for coming on. Appreciate it. Appreciate you having me. Hey, I just want to say thank you for tuning in to this episode of Milwaukee Uncut. We would love it if you hit that subscribe button and also liked this episode. That helps us get more eyes on Milwaukee Uncut. Thanks again for your support.